Thank you, songsters. <clears throat> Singing one of the great, great songs that's come out of Salvation Army composers. Marvelous. <clears throat> I was quite encouraged this morning as I was uh, in my office and I was talking to um, our enrollees. And I was talking about the message this morning. I said, I knew it was going to be a busy meeting, so we're gonna, it's not going to be quite as long as usual. I said, most po- people will probably be relieved by that. And Emma said, oh, but Captain, I like your sermons. You always start with a good joke. <laughs> I said, unfortunately, this morning, I don't have a joke. Because this morning, I'm going to have to start with a bit of explaining. So bear with me for just a moment. If you have your copy of the source, if you turn to the inside page, I think it's the right-hand inside page, you will see an image of a lady's hands holding two small coins. The image is the, the widow's mite. Look at that there. Below that, you will see a covenant. And I'll briefly tell you what that's about. Because otherwise you'll be looking at that going completely confused, I suppose. In two weeks' time, we will have a special Covenant Sunday. Uh, this, as we've already discussed, as Jerry, our core treasurer, said earlier, is, is a month where we're looking at stewardship. We don't do that very often, quite honestly, uh, in the army. Uh, but it's a very important thing to do because it is a very scriptural thing. And in two weeks, you will receive a copy of that covenant on a card with an envelope. What we want you to do for the next two weeks to, is to pray over that covenant. And as you read it, some of you might look at it and sort of the way it reads, and there's an area there to sort of enter a number, and it's, it's a percentage, and many of you will think, well, that's 10%, isn't it? Oh, yes, it is. But as you look at that covenant, I recognize we've got some people in our congregation, as with any congregation, who, who don't give much or anything at all, or don't think about the significance of stewardship. It's an opportunity to take a step for those folk. If you give a tenth, if you give more, keep giving. Put that number down. But in two weeks, we're going to ask you to complete that card. To place that card in the envelope, to put your name and your address on the front of the envelope. And there will be three boxes. There are two here, but three boxes that look like this. And we'll give you an opportunity to come and to place the envelope in the box. Now, no one will be watching to see who comes and who doesn't come. As Jerry said before, I'm a big believer that tithing is an extension of our heart. It shouldn't be a, this is what you must do. It's what your heart tells you you should do. So if they're not ready, I'm not going to criticize anybody for that. Neither will I ever open these and look at them. I will never see what's on those cards, never ever. We will put them in here. They've got locks. They will remain locked. I will lock them, but they will remain locked for a year. They will stay in this chapel for a year as a constant reminder of that promise, that covenant. And in one year, we will take them out, never looking at them, so make sure you seal them, and we will mail them to you. I've done this in my previous two appointments, and the testimonies that come out over this are remarkable, where people said, I took that step, and it's amazing how God made sure I never missed that money. Anyway, just bear in mind, that's what that's for, so pray about it, that's the important thing. Pray about that for the next two weeks, really pray over it, and then as I said, we'll have that special service. That theme of stewardship, and if you're a visitor today, please understand this this message today is very relevant in every area of life, and the story of this young man is relevant in every area of life. It's Mark chapter 10, open your Bibles, if you will, to that. He's described in the book of Mark as a wealthy man. In the book of Luke, he's described as a rich young ruler. And this is probably one of the most interpreted and played with portions of Scripture. It is amazing how many theories I've heard behind this Scripture and some of the imagery that is created here. So what I want to do today is to try and offer to you a representation of this encounter that is as clear and as accurate as possible. So we have a full understanding of what's going on here. Because the question that this man asks is a crucial question. So by looking at this story, we can start with the geographical things going on. Jesus, at this point, was south of Jerusalem. He was making his way up through Jericho, through Bethany, to make what we call the triumphal entry. So there is a significance of the fact that Jesus is kind of on his journey right now towards his crucifixion. And while he's on that journey, this young man asks him probably the most important question that we could ever ask. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Let us not forget, that is the question that prompts this exchange. It is a massive question. 
Therefore, if it's the biggest question we could possibly ask, the answer that is given should be one of the greatest answers that we listen to and that we adhere to. So this morning, we're going to join in with this young man and we're going to ask the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, the story starts out actually quite dramatically in its own way. There's Jesus walking along in Judea, and suddenly this guy runs up to him and plants his knees in front of him, looking up at Jesus, and asks that question. A very promising start, because he's showing a level of humility. He was a wealthy guy, a rich young ruler. Yet he thought nothing of getting down on his knees before this man. He saw Jesus as a teacher. Contrast that, if you will, to Luke chapter 10, where the expert in the law, stands up, almost confrontational style, and says to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life, prompting Jesus to give the parable of the Good Samaritan. Also note the way that the young man addressed Jesus as good teacher, whereas the expert in the law simply said, teacher. There's a bit of an exchange where Jesus says a few things about the word good, but that's another sermon for another day, because I want to get to the, to the next thing that Jesus talked about. His immediate response was, you know the commandments, right? And he recites them, he says, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. But as you look at that, even the most casual of glances, you will realize there are not ten listed there, there are only six. And the reason for that is uh, Jesus leaves out the commands that pertain to God. Four of the commands pertain to God, the other six pertain to the way that we treat other people. He doesn't say, you shall have no gods before me, you shall make no idols, you shall not take the Lord's name in vain or honor the Sabbath and make it holy. He doesn't list those at all. And then he plays with the order. He goes, if you've got the New International Version, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, five, as he lists them. In the King James Version, he goes 7, 6, 8, 9, 10, 5. Whichever way, he plays with the order a bit. It's very interesting the way Jesus presents the commandments. But I want you to pay particular attention to the way the 10th commandment is represented here. Because the 10th commandment says, thou shalt not covet. That's not what Jesus says. He says, don't defraud. Thou shalt not defraud. Now you might think, well, perhaps he tailored it a little bit to to suit this wealthy man. After all, he was wealthy. Maybe he didn't covet his neighbor's house. Maybe his house was bigger. Maybe he didn't bother with his neighbor's wife. Maybe the neighbor's servants or animals or other belongings were of no interest to him. But I think that Jesus was making a particular point by changing it up just a little bit. You see, the word that uh, is used here, the Greek word aposterio, which he uses for that uh, uh, particular word defraud, means to deprive, deny, or withhold. To deprive, deny, or withhold. And in light of the condition that Jesus gives this man of getting eternal life, that is, he sells all his possessions, it would seem that Jesus' primary point is Your selfish grip on your money is going to prevent you from inheriting eternal life. Remember that question? That was the crucial question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says there's one more thing you need to do. Set it all. Give it to the poor. That's what you need to do. But then it says in verse 22 that he went away sad because he had great wealth. And that encounter causes Jesus then to turn to his disciples and say how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Indeed, it's easier for a camel to enter through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. That is a preposterous image. We see it as a troubling image in many ways. I've heard many people come up with theories, maybe Jesus meant something else. There's the eye of the needle gate theory where there's a gate in Jerusalem called the eye of the needle and the image was that a camel walking upright could never walk through this gate but if it got down on its belly and crawled underneath it could make its way through. I've heard that theory. The problem is it's not consistent 
with the original Greek language that's used. Matthew and Mark use the word raphic. That simply means a needle, not a gate. It just means a needle. Luke uses the word balone. Balone basically is a surgeon's needle, just a tiny bit bigger. But the absurdity is the same. It's not a gate. Others have said, well, it's actually a mistake. Somewhere along the way, there was a misprint. Because the word rope, when you think about putting a rope through the eye of the needle, the word in Greek for rope is kamelos. The word for camel is kalimos. Very subtle difference. Some people say there's a, a, a misprint, an error, that it means it's easier for a rope to go through the eye of a needle. Well, I think I find that just as hard. I'm not sure I could ever get a rope through the eye of the needle. The key to this exchange is not in those words. I'm quite fine with the camel and the eye of the needle. That's what Scripture says. The absurdity of the notion is what Jesus was putting across. Whatever he said prompted the disciples to say, who then can be saved? They were aghast. It was impossible. Who then can be saved? The reaction tells me that. To which Jesus responds with man, this is impossible. But not with God. All things are possible with God. Sometimes we can be very guilty of looking at a portion of Scripture and making it about something that's so apparent in front of us. But I think there's a bigger illustration that Jesus is giving here. And he's talking, or using this illustration, if you will, to talk about the power of the resurrected Christ. When the disciples responded to this idea of a camel and an eye of a needle, they didn't say, how can rich people be saved? Their response was, who then can be saved? I think Jesus was reacting to that. A number of years ago when I was in England, I uh, worked for a company called Wesley Barrel. Wesley Barrel made the finest upholstered furniture in the country. And I was the manager of, uh, of the Wesley Barrel store in Birmingham, England. A good friend of mine was the manager of the Wesley Barrel store in Leamington Spa in England. That's where I started with the company. I worked with this guy. Uh, he was old enough to be my father, a good friend. He knew that I was a Christian. I knew that he wasn't. And so one day we were having a conversation, and he said, you know, I think I'm a Christian. I said, really? I said, well, what makes you think that? He said, well, I'm a good person. I really am. I, I treat people right with respect. I've never really done anything wrong. I'm a good person. Yeah, I'm a good person. I can, I can get, I'll get to heaven. I'm sure I will. And I looked at him and I said, you know, Bob, you are a good person. You're my friend. You're a good person. But good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people do. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people do. Scripture <clears throat> talks about a wealthy man you know, a wealthy man who was forgiven. You know the story. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up into a sycamore tree for he wanted the Lord to see. He wanted the Lord to see. How does it go? And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up into the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, come on down. I'm coming to your house for tea. Who knows truly what happened in that house over those cucumber sandwiches and cups of tea? <laughs> That's a real tea. But whatever it was, it prompted this response from this man who is described as a tax collector, therefore a sinner, a defrauder. And he was described as wealthy. This is his response to his encounter with Jesus. Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. To which Jesus then said, Today, salvation has come to this house. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people do. And I think, to be honest with you, if you're clinging to the things of this world, you have not, perhaps yet, experienced true forgiveness. Because I, I, I know in my own experience and in everything I've seen that truly forgiven people no longer think about themselves. I'm no longer looking out for me. 
Once we're in receipt of this gift of forgiveness, we realize that nothing else matters. So what does my attitude towards my possessions tell me about my salvation? Because I think these two stories show a deep correlation between the two. I see, and I believe this very strongly, that our attitude towards giving is a reflection of our heart. I'll read the verse that Jerry read earlier from 2 Corinthians where Paul says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves, God loves a cheerful giver. What is your heart telling you? Is your heart telling you to give or not to give? Is it prompting you to defraud, that is to withhold, or to pay what you should? And based on the question that was originally asked, is your heart push, pushing you towards eternal life? Or will you walk away sad? This morning, it really is, how is your heart? That's the key to the whole thing. That's the key to everything when it pertains to Christ. Have we truly given our hearts to him? Have we truly committed our lives to him? Song 622 says, Savior, my all I'm bringing to thee. Speak, Lord, and I thy voice will obey. Seal me just now, thy servant to be. For more of thy power, dear Lord, I pray. And the chorus says, and as we sing this chorus, I want to take a few moments. If you just want to come and to kneel at this place, just spend some time in prayer. Maybe pray over the things I've said today. Maybe pray over the covenant that's in there. Maybe you've got something on your heart you just need to offer to him. And while that happens, we're going to sing the chorus of that song, which says, Lord, with my all I part. Closer to thee I'll cling. All earthly things that bind my heart Dear Lord, to thy feet I bring. Let's sing that chorus together. And please come and kneel at this place. Come kneel at this place. Come and make sure your heart is where it needs to be. Let's sing that chorus again. Lord, with my all I part, closer to thee I'll cling. All earthly things that bind. Father, this morning as we've, as we've looked over this portion of Scripture. And Lord, as I look over this congregation, I see so many who give so readily and so joyfully. And Lord, that, that does my heart good. And boy, I know it does your heart good. I thank you, Lord, for the commitment of this congregation to support the ministry of this Salvation Army, whether it be here or countries a long, long way from here. I thank you for the fundraising that goes on. I thank you for uh, the, the absolute commitment of time. But this morning, my, my prayer is not about those things. It really is the hearts of all of us. Gracious Lord, you came to earth never for yourself. There was nothing selfish about your commitment to us through your life and through your death and through your resurrection. That was never ever about you in any way shape or form it was always about us 
But Lord, I know we who say we will take up our cross and follow you, we who say we want to be like you, sometimes can be very guilty of withholding things from you. Lord, it's not just money, it's time. Even time spent at the home, opening your word and praying before you. Lord, we can be so guilty of being wrapped up in our own lives that sometimes we can be guilty of forgetting of the life that you presented before us, the promise of what is to come, and that is eternity. If our hearts are troubled this morning, if somehow this has stirred something in our lives, in our soul, I pray, Lord, that we'll act on it. I pray, Lord, this morning that nobody will go away sad, but indeed will go away just rejoicing over the fact that we are changed people. Lord, we just thank you for the gift, which is you. Let's sing that chorus one more time. Lord, with all I've got, closer to thee, O King, and cling to him this morning. Cling to him like you never have. It's a world where we need to hold firm to Christ. It's a world where our heart needs to be like Christ. Let's sing it together one more time. Lord, with my all I part, closer to thee I'll cling. All earthly things that bind my heart, dear Lord, to thy feet I'll bring. And may it be, Heavenly Father, that we cling to you like we've never clung to you before. And may all the earthly things that bind our heart be given over to you so that we might kneel at your feet and be reminded that our question should always be, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Show us the way, Lord, and may we be strong enough to do what we need to do to have eternity with you. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.